Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overall Series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. In this episode we do have a Earth to Jupiter transfer window coming up and so I've taken a look at the contracts. I picked up a science data from Space Around Jupiter mission which should be straightforward enough especially since it gives us 28 years to do it but it doesn't really offer much by way of rewards. But taking a look at the other contracts we have basically two additional options. We've got uncrewed Ganymede landing and uncrewed IO landing. They both require telemetry analysis from the surface but no other signs particularly required and uh, but it takes a lot to land on these things. It takes more to land on IO than to land on Ganymede. It takes about 6,000 meters per second to slow down into orbit around Ganymede but 11,000 to slow down into orbit around IO when, uh, after doing the transfer to Jupiter. So I think we will try Ganymede. It gives us nine years, which is not a long time, but basically there's a Jupiter transfer window every year. So that we've got that going for us. It's actually easier to launch to Jupiter than to launch to Mars, though the transit time to Jupiter is much longer, of course. We haven't had much luck uh, making sure that our Jupiter missions stay in the right orbits. <laughs> That's a separate issue, but let's pick this up. It's very lucrative, as you can see. But uh, we, you know, we actually have to do it, and the cost, the failure, is well, once again not an option. So uh, let me go to the VAB and show you what I've got in order to fulfill this. All right, so here's the Ganymede lander on the Nico 3340, and that means that there are no NK9 variant engines, no NK19s or 9K NK31s. Uh, I'll get to that in a sec. First of all. Uh, we've got, well, this part is the lander right up till here. And so it's just got to land on its belly. There are no landing legs because landing legs add extra mass. Uh, this is a surveyor core which can carry one ton. And if we bring out Mechjeb, we see that it is very close to being one ton here. Uh, in fact, it's so close that I even uh, went away from this Pioneer uh, 10 slash 11 class antenna, which has a two gigameter range and I've opted instead for this AIES Comlar 1 dish which is lighter it's uh, 0.045 tons whereas this one is 0.08 tons so this is heavier but this one has less uh, electric charge consumption this one has 160 watts and this one has uh, well Trying to do the math in my head. Probably not a good idea. Anyway, it, it, it takes more. So we have uh, two RTGs to deal with that. Yeah, I'm a little bit worried. It's really tight. They're 160 watts each. So one uh, would take care of the severe core just fine. But I'm wondering if I need one more to deal with the antenna. Or whether it'll be okay. I mean, all I have to do is time warp and uh, their RTG should restore power. Yeah, I think it'll be alright. We've got a reaction wheel on there. And then the amount of delta V is really impressive. Right now it's locked. But this one ton thing has 2,700 meters per second of delta V. Which I believe is enough to land on Ganymede. And we have a Ganymede thrust weight ratio starting off of 2.56. Obviously, we've only got one kilonewton thrusters though. One here and one here, so just two of them. And uh, they're gonna go for eight minutes and try and land us on Ganymede. Uh, we do have tiny little RCS thrusters to help, but it's gonna be a touchy business. And yeah, that's about the sum of it. And we've only got the tiniest instruments on here. We don't have any goo container or anything like that. And because after all, all we have to do is transmit the uh, analyzed telemetry thing. After that, we have uh, two more RTGs on this to power the Delta Avionics package there. And we've got um, Gemini Lander engine. And that's good because the Gemini Lander engine and these RCS ports actually use the same, same fuel ratio. After that, we've got an Asterisk stage, Asterisk 2s. That better be configured to Asterisk 2. Yes, it is. And there are five of them. And that doesn't have any RCS because I wanted to make sure to use this RCS because it would be more efficient that way. 
the ratio is not the same. Now I had to play some games here. Uh, the total amount of Delta V in all of this is 10,000. I've locked the tanks uh, for you know, safety's sake. But um, here I've used a balloon tank and then the service module. This technically needs feed pressure, right? Uh, so it needs at least uh, to be attached to a service module tank. But I've made this a balloon tank. I don't know how legit that, that should be seen, but uh, I went with that mode to save mass. And similarly here we have a balloon tank and then the service module tank down here. And these are all attached to that. You can see very stable instead of feed pressure too low. So I am playing a little bit of a game there. And uh, I even do that with the next stage. Uh, well, not exactly the same game. I just use balloon cryo tanks. We have unlocked the J2 engine. And so instead of a huge array of RL10s, we have a single J2, mainly because it's cheaper. Um, yeah, it's not quite as efficient as the RL10s. It's heavier. But if we take a look here, it's 2,200 for one of them. Whereas the RL10s, it's 1,300 each. Now, the J2 does have some drawbacks. Uh, in particular, it's heavy. And also, it only has three ignitions, not ten. But all we needed to do is our transfer over to Jupiter. So that's all it's going to do. It's got 6,586 for that. It'll probably get some help from the stage prior to it. That's the plan. But it's got the maneuvering thrusters. And once again, I've got a balloon cryo, balloon cryo, and balloon cryo. So it's a very lightweight tanks in order to make this possible. And well, I mean, technically Centaur is balloon cryo, but then it can't really carry a very heavy thing on top of it. So it's a little bit dubious, but I want to try this Ganymede lander thing, and otherwise we'll have to wait until we get some more efficient engines, whichever those would be. But uh, anyway, otherwise we've got the NK-15s as usual. Well, let me go to the second stage, which is sort of inconspicuous here because it's stout. It's got the main controller unit, the Saturn instrumentation unit. Oh, up here, up above, we've got the Thor Delta unit. That's why we can move the Saturn instrumentation unit down there. So we're not carrying so much mass up here. The Thor Delta avionics unit is there. And that can carry 120 tons. So here we have uh, four NK-15Vs. Well, actually NK-43s. And uh, they burn for four minutes. And then at the bottom... Oh, let's not continue with the Ganymede thing. Uh, we've got boosters. Six boosters. So that uh, we've got a total of 33 engines there. And then the core. And really the core doesn't burn for that much longer after the boosters separate. Now that's just in the way of things. We want to use the engines for as long as we can. Right there. Knocking it down by one point of utilization seems to help a bit. And that's about it. So, it's pretty optimal. Uh, 1.39 thrust to weight ratio at the start. Should allow for uh, one engine out, but we're hoping that these engines, now the NK33s and 43s, are more reliable throughout the whole thing and it is somewhat dependent on that. 3,800 tons on the launch pad and so the NK-15Vs will be expected to restart to start our transit to Jupiter and then the J-2 will finish it and hopefully the J-2 will be reliable even though this is the first time we are using it. Okay well anyway let me sort out the staging but we've already got uh, starting to build and I'll have to remember to sort out, uh, if there's any staging error, I'll have to remember to fix it on the launch pad, otherwise we'll, we're going to be in trouble. Okay, so there it is. And we are not going to just send this out. Uh, we should send some other cheaper Jupiter mission, just to do some more Jupiter science. And so I will show you that. Okay, so this is the AGS-1 on Nico 411N. And we'll get to that in a sec, but AJS stands for Affordable Jupiter System. And so we're trying to send probes to Jupiter without building a huge rocket like the Nico 3340. And in this case, we've got plenty of RTGs. That's, that's a very expensive part. They're 1,000 apiece, and it's only a 25,000 fun launch. But frankly, the solar panels would be even more expensive. 
so we might as well carry these instead. And of course it gives us more flexibility as to what stages we can keep with us. So uh, here we have a little probe with magnetometer, goo, and uh, orbital telescope. And we'll try and fly by one of Jupiter's moons. Maybe capture around Jupiter, maybe not, we'll see. But Delta Avionics package, and then... So the staging is as you see it. We've got a Gemini lander engine again, an Astros 2 engine. But uh, we have a new stage to work with. And that is the revival of the Agena vacuum engine. And it turns out that once you get around here, the Agena is useful again. Because it's got, instead of having the 290-ish ISP that I had before, it now has 312. And that's pretty handy. Um, the downside of it is that it only has three ignitions instead of the infinite ignitions that we have with these engines up here. Um, the upside is loss of thrust, uh, 76 kN compared to 22 from the Asterisk and 11 for the Gemini Lander engine. And uh, the ISP is good and the fuel mix is okay. I don't know what the burn time is actually. When I uh, mill click on it, it doesn't give that information and taking a look at the text, it doesn't say. So it might not actually have a limited burn time for all I know. Uh, what I would like is this one, the, mo uh, the model 8096L which is probably a hypothetical one because it says reusable Agena for the space transportation system uh, that's the space shuttle and that had 324 seconds of ISP and 15 ignitions which will knock quite a lot of things right out of the water so but that will require advanced rocketry but this is handy so we don't have to have you know in the previous launch we had the cluster of uh, asterisk twos and the reason we had that is because I wanted you know a lot of ignitions but uh, here we're not going to need all the ignitions. This is going to help us on our transit to Jupiter, but we don't need uh, it to restart ever. So yeah, uh, it'll be fine for this purpose and it'll give us a little bit more of a push. And then after that we have the normal stuff, which is a single uh, NK-31 there. And then the Nico 411N is very different from the Nico 411. Nico 411 had uh, four uh, NK 33s and then one NK 43 as a definite second stage, and then of course the NK 31 as a third stage. Here we've got the NK 43 at the center and NK 33s on the side as boosters. And this is leveraging the fact that these engines are more reliable now. This would be a bad arrangement if we had the old lack of reliability with the NK-15s because, you know, one engine going out could se severely throw things off. Uh, they're further away from the center of mass of the vehicle and so their gimbling isn't going to be able to compensate as well. Also, if the NK-43 uh, goes off, the, well, even if it went off on the old NK-411, it would have been a bad thing because it would be the only engine active. But uh, yeah, so we're going to launch with all engines lit, and um, if we could throttle down the NK-43 eventually, that'd be good. But as you can see, the sea level thrust weight ratio is only 1.22. So it's not really designed to have a failure. It's not really designed to have a failure at all. And we're going to hope that it doesn't. So anyway, that's the idea. A fairly cheap launch and quick to build, 22 days. So we'll build two of them. Okay, so checking the tech tree for where advanced rocketry is, it's right here and we can't research it yet because we haven't unlocked the last stage in the R&D building. Uh, so we can't do sciences over 500 yet. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's got Merlin series here. Um, and that includes the Merlin 1D, but it's just a horrible model. Which is weird because then you have uh, modern rocketry here and this has the Merlin 1D here <laughs> and uh, this has a much better model but you know it's just the Merlin 1D uh, it does have Merlin 1D plus and plus plus but that 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 should just be stuff that we get along the way I suppose you know just like the other engine configurations unlock maybe maybe these only unlock once we've gotten those and we only get the Merlin 1B right here perhaps Maybe that's the thing. Anyway, uh, just looking at that, and we do have some science, so I actually wanted to put it to some use. The only thing that seemed really tempting, because we were already unlocking nuclear propulsion and mature hydrolox engines, 
and effective space planes was integrated avionics because there's this Delta avionics unit and we're currently using the Thor Delta avionics unit that can carry 120 tons and weighs 0.2 tons. This one can carry 275 tons and weighs 0.2 tons and has the same power consumption. So that would be a good deal. And otherwise though, there's not much going on in this. Um, I, I do like these uh, these linear RCS arrays because they have the high heat tolerance here. You see 2400. Uh, well, I gave them that, but it seemed logical given their shape. Um, they're four space planes and p potential, you know, space shuttles. So I will, uh, I think I'll research this. So that'll be good. But otherwise, there's nothing that jumps out at me. There's a lot of uh, potential technology here, like ScanSat uh, anomaly scanner, multispectral sensor. I think this would be, I mean, there's a lot of non RP0 parts because. Uh, those parts are from Lackluster Labs and I haven't actually dealt with them or stuff like that. Yeah, and this is a D-Magic one that uh, apparently has not gotten support yet. So, yeah, that's a mixed bag. Otherwise, I, I wish we had more station parts. I might have to look into that. This one isn't too bad. Um, it's, this says non-RP0, but I'm the one who's working on that. Uh, this is uh, from the... USI packs and you see RO in progress. Well, I put that there. Um, I was looking for uh, these as little maintenance units and rover stuff. See this herp jump seat and um, I think there was another rover. This one, AES pod, I wanted as a rover pod. So maybe that's something we can unlock. Otherwise there's some interesting structural units and don't know about the service bay. But maybe I should uh, hold off until later. Uh, we might want to go after some of these higher technologies here first. Let's take a look at how much it costs to upgrade the R&D building. Looks like it's two million, but I hesitate because I want to keep our cash on hand just in case we have trouble doing that Ganymede mission. We might be able to weather the blow a little bit better, though still it would cost more than we've got. so. To consider that but uh, yeah anyway we've built our rockets let's proceed with the initial launches uh, time warp to closer to the transfer window actually I should use the transfer window planner to see when the real transfer window is because mm, it seems like it's right there okay here we go with the AGS-1 on Aniko 411N Throttle up, SAS on, and ignition. And launch. Well, first attempt with this rocket. Have to say that with the new MechJab settings, it's not very responsive during launch. It takes a while to turn to the number I set it to. So maybe a little bit faster on this would be a good thing. Okay, so far so good. We're past Mach 2, 20 kilometers. Okay, getting ready for booster separation now. separation. Okay, they're off cleanly. Very nice. Oh, I still gotta get that fixed. Uh, more recent versions of RVE have that little transition fixed. But anyway, uh, MK-15V continues on. Extra long burn times now that we uh, feel that these are more reliable engines. We can actually do fairing separation now. Though th there is a wide body here. Well, we'll see if it clears it. This is a relatively cheap mission, so... Best to test it now, I suppose. Okay, very good. Oh, I forgot to mention, on the Agena stage, you'll note, it has solar panels all around to provide power for the 
for the Gans unit, the Thor Delta Avionics unit. That seemed the best way to do it for that stage. Especially when we replace that uh, Agena engine with its 12 or 15 ignition counterpart. I think it was 15 ignition. Uh, it could probably be reused and ha have a docking port on top. We should be able to, with uh, KIS, like, replace an engine, too. That would be an interesting thing. I wonder how big an engine the Kerbals can carry in space. In the old engine ignition system, before it got melded with uh, Realism Overhaul, it was an engine igniter mod. Um, I think you could actually replenish the ignitions on uh, engine. Kerbals could EVA and restore the ignitions by servicing the engine. I never actually did that myself, but it would be a good idea. I think that would really make people much more inclined to have the engine ignition feature. I think a lot of people have turned off by it, but... I think if you had it where Kerbals could EVA and give the engine ignitions back through maintenance, that would be a very attractive thing to do. Make the whole idea of engine ignitions much nicer. Okay, getting close to orbit here. Shut down. 231 by 200. Wasn't particularly looking for a circular orbit. Uh, in fact, we have 1,200 meters per second left in this stage, so we'll probably want to use the RCS up there to settle the fuel down and turn to the maneuver node once we get to it uh, to make use of this extra fuel. And unfortunately, we didn't put any RCS on the stage down here, so that's not so great. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, but uh, almost 30 tons to orbit here uh, with the Nico 411N. That's pretty good. All right, let me uh, take a look at what MechJeb has to say about this whole transfer situation. Uh, not maneuver node editor, maneuver planner. And we don't need a home and transfer this time because we're tightly in orbit around the Earth. So it should be a normal sort of transfer situation with the, with the whole, whatchamacallit, Mm, advanced transfer to another planet pork chop selection yes pork chop selection there we go hmm this isn't exactly well what, what does it give me for ASAP okay how about Lois Delta V well that's in a year let's just go with uh, this ASAP one okay create node okay well that'll do we just wanted to fly by a Jupiter but you know what look at it I, I feel like, uh, I mean, we're getting closer, obviously, to the Voyager transfer window. And I feel like if we could deflect our orbit properly, we could get to Uranus and Neptune. Because they're, they're slow. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're getting ready to line up with the Voyager window already. Obviously, Saturn is not there yet. Uh, I'll have to wait a few more years before that part of it uh, lines up. But uh, after passing by Jupiter, we could go on to Uranus and Neptune. So let me work on that and I'll come back to you. Okay, well I take it back. Saturn, actually not in a bad spot. If you take a look there, uh, we've got a temporary periapsis. I haven't tried to get it very close. But so what we've got here is we're going to be slinging by Jupiter this way around. And that'll bring us to within the orbits of, well, within the orbit of Europa, between the orbits of Io and Europa. We're not really hitting one of them, but on the way out, we have a chance to hit Saturn. We could probably fine-tune this a little bit, but there's no point. I can't do the maneuver precisely enough to warrant uh, fiddling around with it right now. But we get to Saturn in six years and 225 days. And if we uh, mess around with that properly, and we hit Saturn in the right way, we might be able to, right now, move on to Uranus and maybe Neptune, we'll see. Right now it's flinging us this way. What we would want is, just like, uh, you see, we've got this curve, and then Jupiter slings us this way. What we want is Saturn to sling us this way, like that. 
and so after we hit it we wanted to go around this like that I mean when it comes to the encounters you have to figure that you can only get them to sling you this way around you wouldn't be able to get Saturn to fling you around this way so that's one way of figuring out whether you've got a chance at uh, gravitational assist or not but uh, this looks good for now I mean uh, this was a very cheap mission oh, a thing that will probably resolve itself yes there we go um, yeah fairly cheap mission so we don't need to worry too much we'll give it a try uh, let's make sure our main antenna is targeting the earth and then we'll time warp and we'll move on to the maneuver node and use up many stages to get to Jupiter timing is going to be a little bit off probably not the best sort of timing we'll have to make adjustments okay um, it should be all settled it says stable so let's go with the NK31 again and now transferring to Jupiter okay and now for the Agena stage revival very nice let's get these antennae out just to make absolutely sure we maintain connection throughout this whole burn process and it's quite a process because we just used the NK31 stage and then we're probably going to use up well we are definitely going to use up this Agena stage we're going to use up this Asterisk 2 stage and we'll be left with the advanced Gemini lander engine at the end of it alright coming to the end of the Agena burn here we have reached escape velocity and no problems with the engines so that's excellent separation and ignition everything's nominal um, we're sort of a uh, little bit early as far as the no burn well no we're about right actually the bar is not is a little bit deceptive we're about halfway through the burn right at the node so should be good hopefully of course still we have to deviate away from from the prograde vector while burning we were the maneuver node was down here and it have been better if we had just pointed straight but it's a little bit off anyway because of the radial and normal components anyway we'll see how it goes no problem so far and of course uh, these engines are test flight free I guess maybe the Agena engine now is test flight free as well because it didn't have the limited burn time probably they've added that in 1.2.2 though alright the asterisk stage is concluding leaving us in this sort of orbit and we'll have to see what kind of uh, gap we have of Jupiter it's sort of critical that our approach to Jupiter keeps our relative inclination to Saturn very low I mean 1.6 is fairly low considering how big Saturn is so we have to make sure that happens um, the initial approach that MechGen Playa had us way off from Saturn maybe more than nine degrees so we have to watch out for that okay here we go and this stage should get us our approach okay well here we go things are shaping up uh, uh, thankfully this is a throttling engine okay here comes the approach then we have to go over to the other side of Jupiter mm. looks like we have an inclination problem as you can see uh, we're coming in much lower than our planned approach still touching the same point so yeah it's just a straight up inclination issue um, well I'll see how best to fix that okay well 150 meter per second correction will get us a pretty nice flyby of uh, Saturn over here uh, 344,000 kilometers though we'll definitely want to pull that in a little bit more just so that we can potentially fulfill that uh, Saturn contract Saturn flyby mission uh, that needs to be 20,000 so yeah Although, well, we may be doing that with another mission. I, f I think we've got a Titan mission. I forget whether it's aimed for the Saturn flyby or for Titan. But, uh, yeah, we just need to do this 150 meter per second burn. It could have been easier on a mid-course adjustment, but 
I think this is fine. And our Jupiter periapsis, also important, uh, will be 460,000 kilometers, which is very close to what it was for the Voyager missions. Their flyby was sort of like this, ensuring that they could get the transfer to Saturn as well. Yeah, that's pretty touchy. Uh, that's a good approach right there. Oh, 343,000 kilometers. A bad inclination, though, especially if you want to maybe hit something else afterwards. You can see, though, the approach right now is getting close to... Come on, game. Getting close to where it might help us get to Uranus, except the inclination is way off. So uh, some sort of adjustment between Jupiter and Saturn could flatten our orbit down, and maybe then we could hit Uranus over here. So getting close to the whole uh, Voyager thing, though Neptune, I don't know, that that's a more complicated situation. Okay, so we've got uh, we've got possibilities here. Okay. We are out of Earth SOI. We are definitely on our way to Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, next launch. Well, this seems rather bulkier than uh, I thought it would look. That's quite a shape right there. All right, well, we have to, well, I want to line up with the moon. Probably don't have to, strictly speaking. Let's take a look, and hopefully this will be an even better... Oh, four degrees we can deal with. All right, we can start off now. It's probably just going to get better, actually. Okay, uh, throttle up, and it'll save us for, from uh, everything falling apart by wiggles, of course. Okay, everything seems nominal. Okay, well, uh, 33 engines will ignite. Here we go, ignition. Okay, can't hear the sound yet, but let's go. Well, it does look a little bit awkward. The boosters are sort of a little bit further away from the body than I'd like. All right, we are past the speed of sound, approaching maximum dynamic pressure. All engines are still on. Okay, we have separation. And throttle up. As the six boosters go away, exactly at the same time as the other rocket separated, by the way, interestingly enough, that 100 kilometer transition zone that I need to fix. Okay. This staging seems a little bit off here. Let's get that there. All right, set, separation. So, uh, and ignition. Whoa! Uh-oh. Oh, putting the ABI unit there, not a good thing. Okay. Well, that's just great. Well, even without the avionics unit, MechJeb still seems to have control. So I guess we're alright. Let's get rid of the fairings. Make sure the dish works since we haven't used this one before. Well, it is curious that we seem to still have control despite the lack of the avionics unit. But I'll take it for now. Okay. Oh! I can't shut it down? Uh oh. Apparently, I can't shut the engine down right now. Well, that's not good. I don't know which direction it's actually pushing us out in. Well, that's, I guess, an avionics issue. Well, let's hope.
All right. Well, we won't be needing those engines. We might as well get rid of this stage now, then. Ooh, game spot. Okay, and... Separation. This will be settled by the RCS. Okay, well, let's get to work before the hydrogen and oxygen boil off too much. Okay, well, uh, bad news. Unfortunately, the overburn, because of our inability to shut down the the second stage means that our apoapsis was in a bad location instead of being able to burn out of a location very close to earth uh, for our transfer we're burning out of a very high altitude meaning that we're not very efficient we're sort of halfway between our periapsis and apoapsis when we actually have the maneuver there and that means that's costing more than it should have instead of costing about 6,600 let's say it's uh, instead costing 7,200 or so. So 600 more than planned. That with the tight margins of this mission, that probably means that we're not going to quite make a Ganymede landing, but let's see how close we get. And so this current trajectory that we've got planned out, we'll, uh, we'll have to do the burn in somewhat less than 29 minutes. And that will get us to this approach at Jupiter and so you see Jupiter there and Ganymede here and we're trying to sort of approach near Ganymede's orbit if we <clears throat> get into orbit around Ganymede's orbit let's see how much it costs to sort of match orbits with it though obviously we could do with some corrections here because we're about three degrees off and of course we'll have to phase with it 5,000 meters per second is less than I thought it would cost. So that's good. So maybe despite this flaw, there's still a chance to land on Ganymede, given that uh, making orbit around Jupiter seems to cost less than I thought it would. But we'll have to find out. Let me time warp to maneuver node, and we'll start this burn. These RCS ports... Oh, these tanks don't have any fuel in them. That's not good at all. Great. Um, well, the fuel is set. Oh, no, it's unstable. Okay. Well, that's going to make it less likely that it is going to work. Ignition. Oh boy, okay, it's not really controlling it very well. Come on. Or I had turned it off for some reason. Okay, well, we're on our way, but we're a bit off. Uh, our timing is off. Everything's off. We'll see if it works nevertheless. We have to get rid of this stage so that we have enough power. As you can see, our power consumption is a little bit bad right now. But that happens to be the exact power consumption of this lower Delta avionics unit. And of course, uh, we will go into low power mode with this surveyor core once we go into time warp. So that will save some power as well. Okay, we are at the end of this stage. So it still shows, oh, the delta, delta V, where is it reading that Delta V from anyway? Oh, from those thrusters, okay. I should stop using that fuel. Separation. And all these guys. Good. Ignition. Or maybe ignition. Oh, blocked fuel. Uh-oh. This gun. Okay, I have to go back to the Space Center. I'm just not doing a very good job on this one. Okay, back to the Space Center and I have to come back. Okay, well the downside is our node no longer works properly. So we'll just uh, hold it here and start. And let's see where we end up. Hmm. Look at all those lines. Those those aren't uh, lines around Earth. That's That's all the lines of interstellar trajectories we've got. 
wonder why there might be problems with some of those trajectories. Uh, we've got those cra that craft uh, approaching Saturn there. And there's the Titan shot. Okay, doesn't seem quite right. Let's hope. Uh, oh, why can't I... What, what, what? Oh. Okay, wow, it was not shutting down when I thought it would. Hmm. That's curious, and it's not like there's a huge delay or anything. Uh, that's a bit of an inclination issue right there. Let's try a mid-course adjustment to fix that. Perhaps we can uh, get a read on our total delta V. Things are sticky right now. Um, total delta V. 6,000 there, and then we'll keep the lander locked. So we said we needed like 5,100 to get into orbit around Ganymede, and then the and then not get into orbit around Ganymede. That's to capture around Jupiter, and then we need maybe another 800 to get into orbit around Ganymede, and then we need to land. Hmm. The lander has 2,700, so that'll be fine if everything else goes well. Anyway, let me plot a mid-course correction to flatten this out with respect to Ganymede's orbit, and then this will be all set, and we'll follow it out into interplanetary space. Okay, so it'll take about 30 meters per second as a mid-course correction to really get, get good with uh, Ganymede's orbit, and so we'll schedule that in 199 days and we can get rid of that and let's follow our probe out so just two launches in this episode but one big one and of course uh, Jupiter missions we know our history with that so we really want to figure things out looks like our power situation is fine no worries there and I'm sure the RTGs will last until Jupiter which is only a couple of years away Okay, we uh, have exited. Let's just double check our path. Everything seems fine as planned. And focusing on Ganymede, you can see oop, a little bit of stickiness. And then our planned correction. Right now we're approaching like that. And our, our corrections will get us nice and flat. Okay, so on that note, I'll wrap it up here and stop time warping, I guess, for now. And I'll say thank you for what. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, three second lag to stop. Okay. I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.